Well, welcome once again to another virtual Sunday school class for College Place United Methodist Church. I'm doing this one a little bit differently. I'm using a different uh, setup. I'm actually using my phone because uh, my computer is uh, being worked on at the moment. So I hope this works. This is the December 20th Sunday school class. This will be the last Sunday school class, uh, virtually speaking. Uh, for this year. Then the following two weeks, uh, that is December 27th and I think January 3rd, uh, those Sundays will be virtual, but there'll be actual worship services, not um, not Sunday school classes, and we will not be having in-person worship. So this is the last Sunday school for the year. This is actually the last Sunday school in kind of this series of virtual Sunday schools we've been doing. If we continue on with a virtual Sunday school in the new year, uh, that would be January 10th or so when we would start back up. Um, if we start that back up, it'll be a different format. This has been purposed to give a Sunday school for those who aren't attending uh, actual in-person service. Uh, most people who had joined us early on have returned back to in-person worship, and we have, um, at our actual gathering, uh, we have maybe one or two people actual joining in the Sunday School. Now, having said that, these videos are being watched by many, many of you who are part of the Sunday School class, but you've returned back to church, but when you, you wanted to continue the discussion, and I am grateful for that, but it might be uh, time to wind down on the actual Sunday school meetings. We'll see. Uh, if you have any thoughts on that, you have any feedback from me, get back with me. Um, but it, it does seem that this has fulfilled its purpose, and I've been grateful for uh, this kind of journey we've been on. It it, it did not uh, go to plan, because I had thought, you know, when this all started off, this won't last very long. Uh, we'll be all back in person, and the pandemic has, has strung out, and so we have just continued on this kind of flowing conversation, allowing our ideas and thoughts and questions and comments and concerns to direct our path throughout this time together. And I thank you for your input. I thank you for your thoughts. Many of you have shaped this journey, and I'm, I'm grateful. I just want to conclude with a final thought uh, today. I don't know how long this will take me to make. Uh, but we're going to have a final thought today, and then uh, if anybody joins me for Sunday school on Sunday, we'll have a time of, uh, as we normally do, we'll have some prayer requests. We'll take some time to discuss what's going on uh, as far as our praise to God, what requests we want to make known. We'll pray together, and if we have any discussion um, that comes from comments or questions, we'll have that, and then we'll be done with this series. I want to recap now what this series is all about. We've had a lot of uh, trails that we've been on, but the main trail started on this idea uh, that was kind of kicked off by the pandemic. Well, let me say that I, I have been, and, and I'm not the only one, I'm certainly not the one that came up with this idea. Uh, people who are way smarter than me have been kind of talking to the church, people who have been watching the church, theologians and, and Christian thinkers and and even some uh, Christian pastors who are, are leaders kind of in the cultural forefront. They're on the front lines in, in, uh, in culture, and they're discussing uh, the future of the church with us. They've been warning us uh, that the steady decline we see in church attendance is something that will, if, if given uh, a push, would be something that could accelerate quickly. So I began to actually talk about that in some of my sermons many, many months ago before the pandemic, saying you know, that the church needs to begin to really think about who we are and what we're trying to accomplish here um, if we really want to stay on task. And uh, we, need to, we need to kind of talk about well, what, what is it that is creating this downward spiral of attendance? And, and what would it be uh, that would kickstart something that would maybe accelerate not only attendance, but maybe a decline in professing Christians. Well, I didn't see a pandemic coming, but it certainly had the same effect. Uh, we had simply been told by, by these thinkers that if something comes along that, that distracts people from the church, 
then we might not get them back. Well, we have seen during this pandemic, a lot of people are distracted from church. Now, I know a lot of you uh, aren't attending and you're doing stuff like this because, well, you want to be safe, you want to uh, be careful, and, and, that's, and you're saying, as soon as I can, I'm coming back, but I'm not ready. And, and that's understandable. We have a vaccine on the way. Very excited about that. But, but the category of people I'm talking about are people really around my age, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger, think, think let's think like uh, early 40s uh, down into even like uh, you know, early adulthood, maybe even, even those who are entering into college at 18. Uh, so a, a big range of people, you know, 20 years or so of, of, of age range, uh, that, that community is starting to question, well, what is the church really for? What's the function of the church? And I won't repeat everything I've said in the weeks past, but what we've been talking about is church has become a lot about uh, the functions, uh, the, the programs, the going through the routines, having this uh, sense of, well, this is what I experienced when I was younger, and therefore this is uh, something that we need, uh, and, and that's not good enough. Just because we've always done church, that doesn't answer the question of why we need church. What is it that we we gain from this? And I think I think a lot of times, it, it, you know, there's a saying that a fish in water uh, is hardly uh, able to discover water itself. And it's because the the fish is swimming around in water; it takes the water for granted. Uh, we we don't recognize the waters we swim in. Uh, I I think that a lot of church people know deep down that church is meaningful, and church being a part of the community of believers is meaningful, but to articulate it in theological terms or in biblical terms or just to break it down into practical matter. Why is it important? Well, well, it's important because God says so. Well, yeah, yeah but God, God is also a God who has purpose and reason. What, why does God see it important? Well, I, I don't, we, we're, we're told to do it. Yeah, but why are we told to do it? And if we can't answer those questions, uh, we may still benefit for reasons we can't even articulate. But we need to be able to express it to those of that category I was talking about. Uh, younger Christians, uh, the, the generations that are actually bringing up the next generations, if we want to see the future, you know, the, the ones who are, are adults now but closer in age to children uh, need to be that influence that helps those children. Uh, you know, I'm raising, you know, a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old and a 2-year-old. I need to be able to articulate to my children why going to church is important, not just because daddy says so, but to say why. And the real reason is, again, we're not going to go through it all, but the church is supposed to be a family on mission. God has designed his church unique. It's not like any social club out there. There is social aspects to it. There is a, a, a sense of belonging, of course, like you would get in a social club. It's not just a place where we learn theology. Seminaries do a good job with that, but the seminary is not a church either. The church is a unique body that is both uh, united in, in, uh, in a relationship and united in a purpose. The, the church is called to be the community of believers that gather in local expressions to demonstrate the kingdom of God. We have talked about how, from the beginning, God has designed us as, as his people. And, and, and when he has rescued us back into his fold, even though we were rebellious, he's calling us back to that original design to be image bearers, to shine his light out to others, that through our lives, we become kingdom representatives of God's kingdom. We become kingdom representatives. And when people look at how we live, uh, they're drawn to God himself because there's something different about the way we love and live in unity that draws people unto the church. At least that should be the case. And a lot of people have not been able to articulate that very thing, that the church exists to be a, a, a group of ambassadors. The Bible refers to us as a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, much like Israel as the people of God functioned in the Old Testament. Um, we're being given uh, this this calling to be reflections of God's beauty out into the world by the very way we live together. Um, so, so what happened is sometime, somewhere along the way, evangelism uh, became very individualized. It became very much kind of one-on-one -on -one discussions about convincing somebody that God is, is real and God exists and God loves them. And, and, and it, become, it, it kind of broke down into just a conversation that you had in, in passing or 
uh, it was up to the evangelist. And, and, and that really is kind of a weak way of reaching people because if it's just a one-off, one-shot, um, people, people aren't going to be convinced. People need to see that not only, they don't need to hear the truth and, and be told what truth is, and they need to be able to affirm that that truth is actually life-altering. That if I'm inviting you into uh, a life of a Christian believer, if I'm inviting you into the kingdom of God as God's representative, that through me God is extending a word of invitation. Come and join. Come and, come and give your life to Christ. Submit your life to Christ. And yet I live like hell. Well, then that person is going to look and go, well, what, what is it that Jesus is really going to do for me? Because you and I, we're not, we're not different at all. And, and, and the church kind of has bought into that. Oh, well, don't look to me. I'm just a hypocrite or I'm just a sinner saved by grace. The, the Bible, sure, we all come in as hypocrites. And yes, Christians can still stumble. But the Bible very clearly tells us that once we, become, we belong to Christ, our, our, our lives, excuse me, our lives will be changed. And we will be able to live in such a way that we glorify God and that there will be proof in the way that we live. Uh, one of my favorite passages, you've heard me mention it before, I'm sure, is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus is talking to the people who would say, well, I, I, am, I, am, uh, I do identify with God, but, but I, sh I don't represent God. Don't look to me. And Jesus is going, wait a second, that's the whole plan. That's the entire purpose. Listen. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. It might as well be dirt. It might as well just be like, you know, common dirt. He's saying to Christians, if, if I've given you a way uh, to, to express God through being like salt, salt helps us taste. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm giving you the flavor of God to share with others and yet you won't share that flavor, well, what what what, are, what difference are you making in the world? You're, you're like everybody else. You're like salt that's not really living as salt, but living like dirt. It's kind of a harsh reality, but it's what he says. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. He's saying, why would you now as light bearers of God, as God shining his light on you, why would you hide that light from others? Why not live it out before others? Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Okay, well, wh why? Pardon me just a second. <clears throat> Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And that's not where he stops. He's giving us the reason that we live together as salt and light in this world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and, in turn, glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, it's not just simply by evangelizing through our words. Now, that's a part of it. we got to tell people the hope and why we believe in God. But he's saying, by, by living out of what you say, by living out your, your image uh, that God has portrayed on you, that God has given you, by living out as salt and light, bringing flavor and light to a dark and tasteless world, you begin to bring glory to God in heaven. So we started off saying we need to live as family. And why? Because that family of God as a church has a purpose, as a kingdom purpose to live as his people. And we need to learn how to be family so that we can be unified together. And, and that's what the vision of the church is for Christ here in this passage. It's what we see in Acts chapter 2. Uh, you can read that for yourself in, in verse 42 and following. A really fulfillment of this vision of people living out their love for one another and people, because of that, coming to know God because they're excited about what they see, God changing lives uh, for others. Uh, now, this is my concluding thought in all this. because I'm just kind of, I've just kind of reiterated what I've already said, but bringing in the salt and light passage. Uh, now, l l let me say that all of this, Living as the family of God, being the people of God, living as we think God has called us to live in love and unity, and doing all sorts of good deeds for, for the people that, that God puts in our path, uh, all of that is great. But 
you can have none of it. And none of it means anything. Good Deeds aren't good unless they're empowered by God. If the gospel that Christ is the center, that Christ's salvation is what actually not only motivates us, but empowers us to live out in the world. If that's not central to our belief, we cannot live as the family of God. So, so as much as we have explored kind of new ideas, not a lot of people, uh, not a lot of churches over the years have explored the idea of the kingdom of God and what it means to be kingdom representatives, what it means to be ambassadors, even though the Bible is clearly stating that we should over and over and over again. Uh, now that we're kind of entering into some, to, to some new thoughts or re thinking things that are old, but kind of hearing them for the first time in, in, in our generation. These things are being kind of brought up again because of the unique challenges that we're facing. We can, we, can, we can begin to be distracted and think that this is all about just being socially just, social justice. And, and then what has happened in the past is social justice or the gospel. You either get the gospel, which is all about God saving us, or we get doing good works for God and and the fact of the matter is, is we shouldn't separate the two. Being saved by God, it, God saves us for a purpose. He saves us so that he can remake us so that we can embody this life of living for God. So Jesus, quoting from Isaiah, I think Isaiah 61, but in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is telling us how his mission is lived out. Jesus is telling us of his kingdom mission. He says, He's quoting from Isaiah. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, the, the central thing here, is, it seems, is, is all about what Jesus has come to do. I, I'm, I'm here for the poor, the needy, the least of these. And, and there's a big, a big call in the church to, hey, Make sure your church isn't just about doing programs that makes us feel good. Make sure your church is reaching out to those in need. But remember, Jesus is telling us at the very beginning of all this that all of this is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We don't get to live out the life of God without God being involved in our lives, without God being the very life that we breathe. So it's very important that we embody this calling by remembering that that's exactly what the gospel is all about. <clears throat> we begin with the gospel. We begin with this truth. And then what, I want, what I've been trying to say this whole time is the gospel is not the end of the story. The gospel is to launch us out into God's mission. The Bible did not end when Jesus was resurrected and defeats sin and death. Then... After Jesus did all of this, he empowered his church, the power of the Holy Spirit, to live out that calling. It started in the book of Acts, and we're still living it out today. So if we're very appreciative of the gospel, we have to live it out. We live it out by being kingdom people. And that's where we're going in this discussion of what it means to be the church, a people who are brought to life by the gospel and then carry that life out to be salt and light for others so that they may taste and see the Lord is good and come to know his glory.